uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Merritt, and I am the Director of Pennsylvania Creative Communities for the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. Um, many thanks to everyone for taking time out of your busy day to join us for this virtual discussion about reopening safely. Um, we've had over 300 people registered for this webinar, which um, highlights the importance of today's topic. And we have a lot of ground to cover, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and Taylor, would you share the welcome um, slide? Um, first, a few housekeeping points. Um, please introduce yourself in the chat. Anything shared in the chat will be visible to all panelists and attendees. So if you'd like to share a question anonymously, please use the Q&A or send them privately to Taylor Talton. Um, questions submitted ahead of time will be addressed, so no need to share them in the chat. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and shared, and any resources mentioned today will be included in our follow-up. And thank you to everyone again, and enjoy the webinar. Um, I'd like to start by introducing Carl Blischka, Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and thank you for everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, just so you know, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts is a state agency uh, in the office of the governor. And our mission is to strengthen the cultural, educational, and economic vitality of Pennsylvania's communities through the arts. I want to give a very special thank you to the Pennsylvania uh, Humanities Council for partnering with us on this webinar, and also uh, a thanks to the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, we have staff uh, from that agency on the phone as well, so thank you to everyone. Uh, I want to also thank our panelists, and uh, I'm going to go through our, our great list of uh, panelists right now. So we have uh, Lori Zaire, who is Executive Director of the uh, Pennsylvania Humanities Council. We have uh, Linda Hollinshead, who's a partner at Dwayne Morris LP. Dana Payne is Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiatives in Diverse Cultures and Heritage for the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. Cecile Shellman is Diversity Catalyst with the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council. And Sarah Merritt, uh, who we just met, is uh, the Council's Director of Pennsylvania Creative Communities. Now, in addition to our panelists, we also have special guests on the, on the webinar for the Q&A session. So uh, very pleased uh, to have these individuals as well. Uh, we have Rodney Akers, who is Deputy General Counsel uh, for the Governor's Office of General Counsel. By the way, he's also Chief Counsel for the Council on the Arts. Uh, Susan Banks is Director of the Bureau of Library Development, Office of Commonwealth Libraries. Nora Johnson is Director of Public Awareness and External Affairs for the Council on the Arts. Uh, Corey Kegerice is Community Preservation Coordinator for the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, PHMC. Uh, Brenda Regal, Director of the Bureau of Historic Sites and Museums, also with PHMC. And finally, Rachel Yerger is a museum curator uh, with a PHMC. So thank you to all uh, for, for joining us uh, for this important <laughs> conversation. Um, so a little context uh, for this conversation. I think that um, decisions about how and when to reopen are uh, complex, and they involve a lot of uh, variables. And Let's face it, this has been difficult for the creative sector, uh, in particular for performing arts organizations. Uh, we know that they were among the first to close and um, frankly might have to be uh, among the last to reopen. Uh, so during this webinar, we'll hear from the panelists and we'll answer your questions. As for questions, we'll start with the, the ones that were submitted prior to the webinar, uh, just because of the number of participants. And we'll, we hope you'll find the, the Q&A sessions helpful, and hopefully we'll cover areas that you've been thinking about. Um, during the webinar, we may not be able to address uh, questions that are very specific to the facts and circumstances of a particular organization, uh, but we can point you to resources uh, in our reopening guide where you might be able to get more specific information. Ultimately, 
our goal for this conversation is to help arts and cultural organizations evaluate their circumstances, plan, and develop reopening plans that work for them in the context of the federal, state, and, and local health guidelines. Uh, so with that, uh, I think I'm turning it over to Lori Zaire. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, hi, I'm Laurie Zier. I'm Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Humanities Council, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're truly honored to partner and co-host uh, on this webinar with the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. This is such an important moment, mm -hmm. and the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts have, has been working on uh, really gathering the information um, that we need um, and working with other partners to provide that to the sector. I can tell you that personally at the Pennsylvania Humanities Council, I'm working, on, I'm working with my leadership team um, to safely and equitably reopen our offices in Philadelphia when the time is right and looking to do programs with partners um, like MJ Freed in Chester, Pennsylvania on our Chester Made project. I can tell you, like you, the Pennsylvania Humanities Council, we've all had to pivot in these times of emerging needs um, during this crisis. And what we've seen um, through our pop-up grants, as well as through our CARES funding, the incredible creativity and resilience of the sector. Um, uh, we're strong, we're adapting, but we're also ready to get back together in person when it's safe to do so. So I'm so excited to hear from all the panelists and everyone here, because there's a lot of collective knowledge and expertise. So let me turn this over to Sarah. Thanks again. Thank you, Lori and Carl, for that wonderful um, welcome and introduction. So I shared in the beginning of the chat um, the link to the Reopening Safely Tips and Resources to Prepare guide that um, the PCA published back in, um, in May, toward the end of May. Um, and you know, it was for created with input from stakeholders, state arts agency colleagues, and extensive research. Um, I think when it started out, it was um, maybe seven pages long, and now it's up to 12 pages long. So it's an ever-evolving document, and um, I try to update it at least once a week, but sometimes it gets updated two or three times a week. So, you know, keep that link with you and refer back to it, because as thing cha things change, and we all know they change every day, um, it will be updated. And also, please feel free to share with me any, um, any great resources you've come across that aren't included in the guide because um, you know, we're all in this together as we keep talking about and um, I'm sure that you all have at some point or another come across something that, we, that I have not included in the document. Um, let's see, so this resource is designed to provide an ever evolving list of tips. Um, and resources by, for use by arts and cultural organizations as they navigate the process of reopening to the public in accordance with guidelines, uh, the guidelines of the state and federal government. It is a tool designed to help strategically plan for reopening and move forward when it is appropriate to do so. Organizations should consider the financial impacts that may accompany the reopening process, including decreased capacity, masking requirements and social distancing measures, and increased costs for supplies and cleaning. For some organizations, being allowed to reopen in accordance with state and federal guidelines does not mean it will necessarily be financially feasible to do so right away. Um, this guide is not intended to be exhaustive or comprehensive in scope, and not every consideration will apply to every organization. Um, organizations should carefully consider the health and safety of their employees, artists, contractors, volunteers, vendors, and audiences when determining whether to engage the public with in-person programming and performances. Planning for reopening is a process, as you all know, and um, it's different for every organization. It requires um, an overview and uh, carefully reviewing all aspects of your organization's operation. Um, and as I said, this is uncharted territory and we learn something new every day. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Dana Payne. Dana is the Director of DEI Initiatives, Diverse Cultures and Heritage with the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. 
and she is going to talk to us about diversity, equity, and inclusion considerations in reopening. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, ALANA, which is the acronym for African, Latino, Asian, Arab, and Native American, and differently abled artists, organizations, and communities are among the most vulnerable during crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic and the civil unrest that we are currently uh, experiencing. Uh, the, ne the negative impacts, which include a lack of access to uh, critical resources are magnified for these constituencies. Uh, these are um, artists and, and organizations who will have the most difficulty recovering from the financial challenges. Um, next slide, please. So um, what we've done, uh, we've listened and will continue to listen uh, to be better able to serve the needs um, of our uh, Alana uh, grantees uh, through direct conversations, webinars, and surveys from the field. Our grantees have identified the most immediate needs, which include, next, um, unrestricted, flexible funding to support general operating expenses. And that is uh, to support the loss of operational revenue from facility closings, canceled programs, events, and other disruptions to cover salaries and rent and utilities. Uh, unrestricted flexible funding to support mm -hmm. new and emergency needs, uh, equipment and supplies such as face shields, sneeze guards, masks, uh, sanitizer, gloves, cleaning services, unrestricted flexible funding to support enhanced technological capacity uh, for remote work options. Uh, that means laptops, paying for hotspots, virtual conferencing and performance platforms, uh, securing staffing and the training necessary to successfully transition to virtual artistic activities. Uh, and finally, um, uh, priority of uh, grantees that we've uh, been in contact with is um, the dis discipline specific informational resources. So these are resources directly related to Alana and differently abled artists, organizations, and communities. So our response uh, for the 2021 program year, uh, we've um, flexible use for uh, grant awards, and that allows grantees to identify and address their most pressing needs, uh, eliminating partial and full dollar-for-dollar dollar match requirement, uh, ongoing communication with grantees, and then continuing to provide updated resource and funding information, uh, and then continue to work on um, our DEI strategic plan goals. So, um, we, we, we sort of established our uh, DEI strategic plan goals in uh, 2018. Uh, if you've started to work on a DEI plan or have the desire to do so, I encourage you just to get started. Uh, and if you've um, paused for a bit, uh, continue the work. Um, next slide, please. So in addition to um, continuously updating local, regional, national resources uh, found on our website. Now, I just wanted to share a few of those resources uh, that provide great information related to funding, operating, serving, uh, and surviving. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Dana. That was great. Thank you. Um, and uh, like we said in the beginning, we will be sure to share all the links um, in the follow up uh, as well as the slides. Um, so don't worry about if, we, if you didn't catch everything. Um, so now I would like to turn it over to Linda Hollinshead, partner at Dwayne Morris LLP. And i uh, just like to give Linda a really um, quick thank you for <laughs> being involved in this um, project as we've moved along and, and the discussions. Um, so take it away, Linda. Thank you. And I hope everybody can see my screen okay. Can somebody give me a little, okay, yep. thanks very much. 
so I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you in these these few conversations that we've had. And, and I want to sort of commiserate with all of you for a minute that this has been an extraordinary time. I mean, I'm an employment lawyer. I've, been, I've spent my entire career in Philadelphia. And in that second week in March, you know, our world went upside down as well in terms of the kinds of things that we were working on with our clients. And I, I work with large organizations. I work with small not-for-profits and everything in between. And you know, every single thing that I was working on on my desk literally stopped. And all of a sudden, we all became COVID-19 experts. And we became experts in things that we sort of didn't have any concept how it would begin to impact the everyday uh, uh, sort of um, way an organization operates, the ebb and flow of a workforce, and then the way that our organizations interact with the public. And I can only imagine how additionally challenging it is for those of you that are responsible for really making this all happen in connection with your various constituencies. So I really commend all of you for all the efforts that you're making. And I, I wanted to sort of share with you where we are at this moment in time as employment lawyers and as, as, as attorneys sort of advising organizations that are very public facing, recognizing that those of you on the call are at very different stages of where you are in your reopening thinking. But one, one thing I can share with you is it is not too early to plan for that moment when you are going to reopen. Um, or that if you are in that process right now to begin to think about ways to minimize some of your risk. And, and unfortunately, being the lawyer on, on the call, it would not be unusual for me to talk a little bit about risk mitigation. Um, and I don't want that to be the driving uh, motivation for this part of the conversation, but it is important to think about that because that is something that is going to be prevalent in some of the decisions that you are making, recognizing that the way in which COVID-19 is impacting really our everyday activities is that we everything we are doing is fraught with risk. And we need to sort of balance that risk with the fact that as an organization, you have to make some determinations that that will allow you hopefully to be able to create a new normal and a way to sustain yourself through this period of transition and hopefully in a, in a forward facing way. Um, so what I wanted to highlight really, I mean, this presentation I, I was sharing with Sarah with others, the last time I did it was about two and a half hours. So what I thought would be the most useful for you is to give you some highlights of the things that are really going on right now. I mean, even as of yesterday, there were things that were being announced in Philadelphia um, and in other jurisdictions. This is such a moving target that on a routine Routine basis, we are having to sort of revise on the fly how we are analyzing these issues. So I'm going to highlight for you some things to think about. This is at a, obviously at a high level, but it will give you a sense as to the kinds of things that your organization, regardless of the size, should be thinking about, and the things that can help you plan when you're talking about how you're going to allocate resources, how you're going to begin to think about your communication strategy. I mean, I've had times in recent uh, memory where we've spent a um, significant amount of time thinking about signage and how are we communicating these principles to our community so that people feel comfortable coming back into our organization because you want to get credit for all the good things that you are doing and that you get you get your constituencies feeling comfortable that you have the public your employees feeling comfortable and that you are putting yourself in the best position possible to be able to demonstrate the good things that you are doing consistent with your legal responsibility because regardless of the size you do have a responsibility to make sure that you are following along with the health and safety protocols requirements recommendations advisories whatever it is that we are calling these things um, having mm -hmm. said that there is a portion of your workforce right now that is remote that may stay remote um, there's a lot of remote work issues that i'm not going to touch on right now during this session but recognize that even as you begin to bring people back into the physical workspace there are other things that you're going to want to be thinking about with respect to remote work compensation pto furlough issues layoffs um, things that are maybe not the most pleasant to be considering as well that are also part of this larger conversation that you need to be contemplating as an organization. So I would re be remiss in not highlighting them. But for today's purpose, I thought I would just talk a little bit about some of the re-entry issues that are going to be useful for you to be thinking about. Um, one of the questions that had been coming in um, when we looked at some of the advanced questions was sort of, you know, where are all of the obligations derived? And it really is a layered effect. You know, we have at the federal level, OSHA and the CDC giving us 
some guidelines, some regulatory compliance, um, the obligation to make sure that we are providing a work freight place that's free uh, of hazards and that we are providing an opportunity for employees to have a, a safe workplace. We've obviously got the CDC and the World Health Organization providing guidelines. Putting the political slant aside for the moment, when you get down to it, we have to recognize that there are certain things that are got lines and certain things that are coming through as mandatory orders. The orders tend to be coming more at the state and local level. The guidelines are actually coming more from the federal level at the CDC point. So we are seeing that the, the more local you get, the more specific and more concrete the guidance is coming. And that's important to recognize because depending on where you are in the Commonwealth, you may have different restrictions that apply to you. For instance, here in Philadelphia, we are sort of in a modified green, which means that it's a little bit different here than it is elsewhere within um, the jurisdictions that some of you may um, currently be in. One of the things that's very important to recognize is that conducting a hazard and risk assessment, sort of having an overall safety protocol is going to be paramount to your success in reopening a physical presence. Whether that physical presence involves indoor uh, presentation spaces for uh, museums, whether it involves library spaces, whether it involves theatrical performances, even if it means that you're going to be converting some of your performances to outdoor venues, you still need to have a hazard and risk assessment that is done where you're taking a look at the various components in which you are operating, regardless of whether you own the facilities or rent the facilities. And this is what I mean by saying advanced preparation now will really help you because this does take a little bit of time and collaboration with the various um, or part in, partners essentially that enable you to do what you do. So if you are a tenant, you need to be thinking about what your landlord is doing for you. You know, I'm at a large law firm office building and we've had to figure out how we're gonna get 500 people back into the office. Um, it's no small feat to do that. Uh, you, some of you are in very different structures and will have different kinds of issues. Some of you are in old buildings that where the ingress and egress is very different. Um, some of you have elevator banks that you have to contend to with. So the these are some of the mundane types of things that you actually have to be thinking about. Um, and I would tell you that that level of minutia and thinking about that will go a long way toward making your patrons and your guests feel really good about the efforts that you are making to um, make the place safe. And, and that translates into people wanting to come back. Um, so there's a legal reason to do this and there's a practical reason because we're not doing this because we wanna get a gold sticker. We're doing this because you wanna get people excited about coming back when you're feeling comfortable enough that you can do that. Uh, it doesn't do anybody any good to have a beautiful glossy PowerPoint presentations and some lovely signage if nobody's going to come back and actually see what you have to offer. So this is, um, and I really mean this, I've been working with um, some small organizations uh, not, you know, sort of not-for-profit organizations that have really gotten um, very specific and granular, like what is it going to mean to the families, the guests, the patrons? What are they going to want to see? And that has been really useful in figuring out and imagining what this new normal is going to look like. Um, and that's having to do with something like looking at the facilities, looking at some of the administrative changes, the practices, the procedures that you follow, um, how, you know, looking at ways you go into facilities and exit facilities and making sure that we're being very thoughtful about the manner in which we are um, doing those various things. I also want to make sure that you're thinking a little bit about personal protective equipment. Um, that obviously is something that we hear a lot of in the healthcare industry right now. Um, masks is a big issue right now. Um, in Pennsylvania, there was another mask order that was just revised and reissued. This is a bit of a moving target as well. Um, and we'll, and uh, there were some questions <coughs> that I will address um, during the open Q&A section, but re recognize that um, personal protective equipment is going to vary again and um, it, really the extent to which you need to have it on depending on your position, but there's, there's a universal mask rule now uh, um, in Pennsylvania that we need to be really thinking about um, in terms of how we're going to roll that out within our organization. And I know that is both a political and a personal issue, but it's really something that we have to contend with as an organization if we're gonna be successful in opening up. Um, and training and communication is really critical. Uh, Pennsylvania has a pandemic safety 
officer. Uh, we decided to give it a title, which is fine, but conceptually, this is something that a lot of jurisdictions are utilizing. It's basically holding somebody accountable within the organization for taking responsibility. So even if you're a small organization and many of you have many hats that you wear uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, somebody's going to have to take responsibility for really taking control of these issues. I mean, it comes to committee but I would really encourage you to make sure that you're thinking about this from a process standpoint. Think about the training, the communication, um, something that I've noticed is a very useful thing to think about now when all of your employees are home. There's time that people have right now to learn, to educate, to think creatively, um, use this time valuably to um, explain to people the way that you're envisioning your reopening happening and use this as a training opportunity as you're beginning to envision how you're going to reopen so that you can get people accustomed to what that new normal is going to be looking like. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of the issues that are um, really paramount right now in terms of reopening, um, screening employees has been a, a hot issue right now about, you know, to the extent to which you can screen employees. Um, is this something that we want to be doing? Talking about your visitors, your employees, it seems so offensive. Isn't it a violation of HIPAA? I mean, I hear everybody talking about this. Um, I will tell you in March, I would have had a different answer for you on some of this than I do today. And literally as we picked, you know, time went, gone, um, went by, there were different answers coming out of the EEOC about the lawfulness of various medical inquiries. Um, in general, with respect to employees, we do not as employers get to walk around saying, tell me about yourself and all your medical issues. I mean, that's a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's a violation of state law. We do not get to normally ask medical questions about our employees. It has to be um, job related and consistent with business necessity in order for us to even begin to engage in that inquiry when you have employees. But what has happened as we have begun to go into this pandemic process, the EEOC has published guidance to essentially acknowledge, much like it did back with the flu pandemic in 2008 and 2009, that we are in a different time right now. And during a pandemic, it is appropriate and not only appropriate um, incumbent upon employers, and it is permissible for employers to ask very specific questions regarding COVID-19 symptoms. That is why it is now permissible and the EEOC starting back in April began to issue guidance saying, okay, employers, you may now ask certain questions. It has to be limited to the symptoms that are identified by the CDC or public health authorities. We have to keep an eye on what those symptoms are. They are changing. They are changing a lot. Um, we have, we're at a little bit more of a stability, uh, period of stability now, but there was a period of time of about a month ago or six weeks ago where those uh, symptoms seem to be changing almost on a 24 hour basis. Um, in general, even though we are allowed to ask about symptoms, and that is the reason we want to know that is we want to make sure people are not coming into our offices sick or into our workplaces sick. Um, the question also has been coming to me is, well, can we ask about employees who may be at higher risk? Don't we want to be careful and look out for our employees who have various medical conditions other related to COVID-19 and be more careful about those individuals? In general, the answer to that is no. You can't say, tell me about everything else that's going on with you so that we can be more protective of you. We are not big brother. We are not supposed to be going out and taking um, our responsibility over that of an employee's to decide whether or not it's, it is um, our responsibility to look out for and uh, protect an employee unless that employee has specifically requested a medical accommodation. And so there are a couple of very useful guidelines and I will make sure we recirculate in after this session of a couple of EEOC guidance documents which have been very useful about when an employer may actually uh, have some engagement and dialogue with employees. But essentially um, high risk employees cannot be excluded from the workplace place just because we're worried, just because we think that person um, might be a higher risk. There has to be what's called a direct threat. And very recently, the EEOC issued some additional guidance that said just because you're older, just because you're pregnant, just because you have a disability doesn't mean that we as an employer get to say, oh, you folks get to stay home or should stay home. We know better than you. You're not really the kind of person we want to come have come back into the workplace. We're worried about you. If an individual in those categories comes forward and says, I need assistance because with a medical note engages in the interactive process, that's a different story. If we want to make it known to our employees that we offer accommodations for those that might need them, please come talk to us, that's going to be okay. But we may not take it upon ourselves 
to uh, presume and because that would be an unlawful presumption. We would be taking on more risk than we want to. So I just want to kind of highlight that as an issue. Um, temperature screening is something else that I think employers used to get um, very wary of. I, I never would have told you six months ago, sure, whip out that, that thermometer and take the temperature of all your employees, see what happens. Um, but now, guess what? We are taking the temperature of our employees because the EEOC has said after the CDC said, temperature is a, an indicator of COVID-19 that, in fact, um, we may need to do temperature scans in order to determine whether or not that person has a COVID-19 symptom before walking in um, to an organization or in, into a place of business. Um, I can tell you my kids who have begun to do some activities as they have now begun to re-enter the world um, are having their temperature scanned on a routine basis as they go to do an activity. Uh, I've had to answer that question several times before I've gone into a doctor's office now. Um, we know we are now allowed to do that as employers, but there's a lot of ways to do it right and there's a lot of ways to do it incorrectly. And there's some screening test steps that I've highlighted here that are important for you to be contemplating and reviewing with your counsel or reviewing with your risk management team before you put them in place because there are some concerns about the time that it might take. You don't want people congregating outside of your offices in a big line to get their temperature taken, not standing six feet apart because obviously you've now defeated the whole purpose of social distancing. So there's a lot of things to keep in mind, but it is doable. So it needs to be something you think about in advance before you are putting um, that in place. Pennsylvania has very specific requirements in the event um, that you have a positive test or a presumed positive test with respect to an employee in the workplace. Um, the April uh, 18th or 19th health order that was issued, which is still in place with respect to organizations that may reopen, um, still applies. And it has an entire protocol regarding uh, an obligation to test employees once a positive test um, has been discovered in the workplace, I would encourage you to become very familiar with that because that is something that's a little unique to Pennsylvania as compared to other jurisdictions. So that once you reopen, you have to recognize that when in the event that you have a positive test that is attributable to the workplace, you're gonna now have some additional protocols that have to be followed and need to be reflected in your health and safety protocol and your employees need to be educated about that as well. Um, I also wanted to make mention of the fact that I get asked a lot of times right now, can I require employees to be tested for COVID-19 before they come back into the workplace? Can I do an antibody test um, for COVID-19 antibodies? Um, both of which were again, um, big question marks, but were relatively recently answered by the EEOC. The EEOC has said, yes, you can as an employer test an employee for COVID-19, send them for a screening test. Practically speaking, that's a big question mark as to whether or not you actually want to do that. A test is only as good as the moment that it's taken because somebody could have COVID-19 um, contracted, you know, the next day, the next hour, technically speaking. Tests right now are coming back very inconsistently and, and taking a lot of time. So that may not be the most useful process to integrate, but from a legal standpoint, it's doable. Antibody testing is not. The EEOC just came out within the last 10 days and said very clearly that is not a permissible medical test um, because of its unreliability and its lack of job relatedness and business necessity connectivity to um, the purpose for which it's being used. So it's not something that we want our employers to be doing. Um, it is incumbent upon you though, as you begin to think about reopening, about other kinds of protocols that you do want to consider. Um, and I, I talk about it in terms of reporting circumstances. So if forgetting about testing people for COVID and, and putting them with the, the sticks up their noses and everything else, talk about communication. Talk about the fact that you want to make sure that your employees know the kinds of things that they need to report to you, that your visitors know, that your guests and patrons know, the kinds of things that they should be reporting to you before they come into your place of operation. Um, they should be reporting to you symptoms and warning signs that they have experienced. They should be letting you know whether or not they have a temperature. These are the kinds of protocols that you should be putting in place and we've been doing it in various points in time. If you've had everybody sitting at home for the last two months, before people come back, you're gonna to need to have them certify 
the extent to which they have experienced various symptoms and experiences before they come back into the workplace. And it's going to be, and this is just an example, and it's changing not only diagnosis for COVID and symptoms, but their close contacts, because we know that's a very big issue. Travel is a big issue right now, consistent with the fact that we're seeing enhanced travel advisories and recommendations coming up. It's incredibly important that you think about asking your employees, uh, visitors, volunteers, people that are coming into your organization on a regular basis, where have they been? And contemplate whether or not you want to impose any kind of restrictions on their activity um, and whether or not they come back in for a certain period of time based upon the fact that they have been to certain places. Um, and we know that that's something that the various jurisdictions are paying attention to. We also want to make sure that we think about whether or not we are putting any other kinds of restrictions on them as we're bringing them back in. This is a very common thing to do. And if you think it's not right now, any of you think about whether you've been at, finally able to get back in for any kind of doctor or dentist appointment right now, how many of you have answered four or five questions on an app on a phone call, on your text message, you know, how are you, you know, feeling? Have you had the following things happen to you? This is this concept that we're trying to get you to sort of roll into your re-entry plan for your employees, for your visitors, um, for anybody that's sort of coming into the fold, so to speak. So this is not something unusual. It's just going to be new for you as an organization. It's a process that you're going to want to think about how best do I, um, enter this into you know the way we operate some of my clients are doing this by paper some of them are doing it by telephone some of them are using apps I mean, it just really depends on the size and the nature and the way you're accustomed to communicating as an organization um, the other thing to think about that's incredibly important and i want to be sensitive to my time here as i see you sarah looking at the clock no uh, I'm I'm gonna... <laughs> the chat so you're good i'm making, I'm making sure here um i know i we've got um also, the real issue that you have to contend with is what happens when you have somebody um, who um, you know, has a, a situation where they, they've been tested positive or they had symptoms and you're letting that person come back into the workplace. You have to have a protocol for that as well. And you have to have a communication strategy concerning how long you are keeping that person out, what circumstances you are going to allow, or under what circumstances you're going to allow that person to come back in, whether that person had a diagnosis a symptom, a close contact, um, and um, whether it was related to travel, self-quarantining, one of these various circumstances. I have to tell you, this continues to be a bit of a moving target. The CDC, on which the Commonwealth has relied at various points in time, has changed the standards on which individuals can return. It is important that you are constantly paying attention to what standards the, you know, the Commonwealth is using with re under the health orders. And when you take a look at what other things might be changing out there to make determinations as to when is the minimum amount of time before somebody may return. And I have some clients that are taking even more conservative positions and are keeping people out for longer periods of time. Sometimes they are keeping larger groups of people out for, for periods of time just to try to uh, create an, a larger opportunity for capturing those close contacts and reduce the potential amounts of exposure. So you have to have a strategy when you're thinking about these things. None of us are COVID-19 experts. Um, many of you on the phone have, are learning about this for the very first time. You're non-infectious disease experts. You should not try to be. You need to try to align yourselves with some folks who are experts in the industry <clears throat> to help you make some of these decisions because this is challenging stuff for all of you, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, and when we make the, um, work on these protocols with our clients, we are always encouraging our clients to work with infectious disease consultants to try to help them work through some of these issues in planning the approaches that they want to take. Um, and some of you may have healthcare providers and uh, employee assistance programs that might be useful in giving you some connections and some contacts that can be useful to you as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, and then I'll turn it back over to um, Sarah to kind of move us to the next section, is to just kind of highlight for you how even in the last, you know, eight or nine days, how much has changed. Okay. There's been an updated mask order, uh, which um, has really expanded the fact that if I want to go out for my run, I better have my mask with me, right? So um, there's been advanced uh, adjusted travel recommendations, which are not requirements, but they're strong 
recommendations and advisories and the list is changing. Delaware was on the list, now it's not on the list. Um, in Philadelphia, we just had something that was issued this week um, related uh, to a moratorium on special events. I did take a look at it. It seems like there's a little bit of wiggle room with organizations that might fall within many of you on the line, but there's this moratorium now, so uh, we need to pay attention to that. In Pittsburgh, all of a sudden we now have a two week uh, basically kind of scaling back of their reopening plan because of concerns that Allegheny County is having with respect to some of, this, of the um, positive test results that are coming out of that region. It is constantly evolving. We're having a bit of a boomerang, unfortunately. And so I can, I can tell you with a, a great deal of compassion and empathy that I recognize this is challenging. Take time now, if you can, to sort of plan for these issues because the best way to deal with the incremental reopening is to try to have a plan in place to manage some of these risks. Let me turn it over to Sarah. I have lots of other things I'm ready to talk about based on the Q&A that came in and we could talk about that during our section we open up. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Linda. That was wonderful. Very, very informative. Um, and. I think there's been a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll try to tra keep track of those. Um, okay. So now we're going to turn it over to um, Cecile Shellman, Diversity Catalyst for the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council and the principal of Cecile Shellman Consulting. Cecile? Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to say that I so appreciate being asked to be here and to speak with you all virtually um, to tell you about some of the practices that organizations are uh, embarking on to ensure, and I'm going to be speaking through a DEAI lens, very similar to what Dana was saying, but to ensure that everyone is physically, emotionally, and psychologically safe in their uh, arts organizations. I, work with museums primarily, but for the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council, I work with both visual and performing arts. And we are taking this extremely seriously. And as Linda said, you know, they're walking back uh, some of those, um, you know, those openings that were happening and people are retrenching and relooking at what needs to happen in order to make sure that everyone in the organization is safe. Here in Pittsburgh, we have a regional group that meets, that has been meeting for about the past eight or 10 weeks, twice a week to discuss uh, opening strategies, ideas, to, um, to, sh to share some resources and to have a dialogue, open dialogue and embark on partnerships. And this is something that's completely new. You know, many of our organizations have not, um, you know, enjoyed working with others before, you know, we kind of tend to keep things close to the vest, but all of this is such new territory and new information and, um, you know, with limited resources due to 2020, which is a year for resetting and kind of looking at our goals and, and where we want to go. We need to be humble. We need to be nimble. We need to, um, you know, set aside differences and work together in order to achieve safety. And I want to say also that I believe that there, there's kind of a twin pandemic, right? Um, so we all uh, witnessed with horror, um, you know, the killing of George Floyd and the, um, the heightened awareness about racism and oppression in our country and in our society. And as we are looking at physical safety regarding COVID-19 coronavirus, and as we are making these plans and being so intentional about what we're doing, we also need to apply that same rigor to what we are doing to, um, you know, to be anti-racist and um, to make sure that everyone, again, is physically, emotionally, and psychologically safe. We also can't forget our visitors and staff and others with disabilities. Uh, we have to make sure that we are taking just as much care in the work that we do uh, to ensure that just as we are um, sanitizing and cleaning and you know, looking under every stone and making sure that, that people are healthy, we need to make sure that we take internal looks and a look at our process, 
who's at the table, who is not um, participating in these meetings, who needs to be at these discussions. Many of us have made statements in support of, um, you know, of black and brown people, of POC folks, and especially um, black people, and saying that black lives do matter. And yet, what are we doing to, to ensure that that is the case and to demonstrate in our buildings, in our uh, practices, that this is the case and that um, we are aware that this is also a scourge that is decimating us. And we know that uh, in the visual and performing arts, uh, black and brown people are you know, not necessarily among those who are the leaders, the directors, you know, for a number of reasons. And some of these are people who have been furloughed just by nature of the organizational structure. So we need to reach out, we need to make sure that we understand that empathy and compassion is at the root of diversity, equity, access and inclusion efforts. And we, we just need to make sure that that remains a constant thread. So I know that we have a lot more to discuss, but those were the main points that I wanted to share this morning. And I want to commend everyone for being, being so intentional and um, you know, working to make sure that there is safety among and for all of us. Thank you. Sarah, you're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got multiple screens going on, so I'm trying to, I'm trying, it's like keeping track of it can, gets confusing. Um, <clears throat> so thank you so much, Cecile. You've made some really wonderful points and the, certainly things that we all need to be thinking about and implementing as we move forward. Um, so now I am, we're going to open up, we're going to start um, answering the questions that we ask people to pre-submit. I will tell you all that we received a lot of pre-submitted questions. Some of them um, are very technical in nature, so I just wanted to let everybody know up front, if you did submit a very technical question, um, if, if it doesn't get answered in this session, um, we, I will work to follow up the resources, links, and share that with you because I, you know, it's all connected to your email in the, in the spreadsheet I have. So I do know who you are. Um, in some cases, I've already reached out to a few people with resources. Um, but, uh, you know, as I said, um, if anybody has any good resources that aren't in the reopening guide, please be, feel free to share those with me. So I would like to open it up to um, Rodney Akers, our general counsel. Thank you so much, Rodney, for being with us today. And so I have um, a few questions for you, Rodney. Um, the first one is, how do you handle leaders who want to push forward with reopening when you feel it puts your health at risk and or the health of the public at risk? Thank you, Sarah. Um, before I answer, just wanted to uh, underscore that I'm delighted to be with everybody this morning and I'm especially pleased to so many, see so many of our colleagues and partners from all around Pennsylvania. Um, as Carl indicated, I am Chief Counsel to the Council of the Arts and as such, um, just please note that any of the following that I share with you should not and cannot be considered uh, legal advice to you. But if you have such questions, uh, we do recommend that you consult with a legal counsel as appropriate to your individual situation. That said, let me uh, answer Sarah's question. Uh, from our vantage point, it's a very simple answer. If you perceive a conflict between behavior that you believe is unsafe versus behavior that you believe is safe, we're gonna recommend that you always choose the safe choice. The safety and well-being of your employees and your patrons should always be at the forefront of what you do. Uh, there are numerous uh, orders and recommendations that are there to protect the health and safety of all Pennsylvanians. But we do recognize that there are uh, those, there are some people who don't necessarily subscribe to or follow uh, those uh, orders and recommendations. Uh, we can deal with how the, those individuals can be handled separately, but uh, as it pertains to your organization, as it pertains to how you're choosing to run your particular uh, business, we always recommend, you know, uh, choose the safe choice. Uh, the orders and recommendations, they're there. If you've got questions about them, you know, you get your questions answered. But um, I, and I'll just use a very simple example that probably most of you have seen in the media. There have sometimes been elected officials who have resisted 
uh, certain of the uh, orders and uh, recommendations of the governor and the secretary of health. Um, those who choose the safe choice have been, uh, in, in the data has shown they've been better off. And uh, so I would just resist those efforts uh, to, to chart what you may perceive to be an unsafe course. Always choose the safe one. Great, great. Um, okay, so the next question is, um, is Governor Wolf's office going to come out with more specific details on safety protocols to open safely, or do we currently have everything we are going to receive from his office? Well, I'll just start by saying that clearly you do not, all, you do not have everything that you're going to receive. As you probably have heard the, the governor and the secretary of <laughs> health, Rachel Levine, say from time to time, the virus is going to govern our response. The virus and how it evolves mm -hmm. is going to uh, dictate you know, what, what we're, we're, we're able to convey. As everybody should be aware by now, there's a plethora of information already available to you on the Council of Arts website. They've got a great reopening document. I'm sure everybody on this call is probably aware of and has seen it. Uh, the Department of Health website, health.pa.gov, mm -hmm. has a, a wide array of information. And the governor's website, governor.pa.gov, which links to many of the health uh, resources, has them as well. Um, as you will know from Linda uh, Hollingshead's wonderful presentation, uh, changes are continuing to take place. Mm -hmm. There are going to continue to be additional uh, orders and or advisories or recommendations that are going to be uh, issued as the response to the virus dictates. The other thing that I also would like to just underscore from Linda's presentation, if I may, is that uh, you're going to also sometimes see targeted efforts in certain municipalities, such as uh, here in Allegheny County, which is where I am right now. Um, as Linda noted, uh, the Allegheny County Health Department, not necessarily the state of Pennsylvania, but those decisions were made in concert with the Department of Health and with the governor's office. Uh, there have been some uh, additional restrictions that have been imposed more recently. Hopefully uh, that will bring uh, the increased caseload under control here, but it's not, an, it's not inconceivable that we might not see similar efforts uh, elsewhere in the Commonwealth uh, as the case, uh, the case numbers have begun to rise in recent weeks. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, uh, we're, we're going to stem that tide and we'll go back to uh, some of the historically low case numbers that Pennsylvania uh, was leading you know, among all states. Great, great. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I think you answered uh, what the next question I was going to ask in, in, in your, in your um, opening remarks, or when you answered the first question. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to skip to the next question. Um, who do we listen to on rules and mandates? Well, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure what's intended by this question, but I, I will say it this, I'll answer it this way. If there's a question as to whether or not the orders and or recommendations of the governor and the secretary of health should be followed, they should. Uh, that's, those are uh, going to be uh, the source of uh, the most current information. It's, uh, these orders and recommendations have been implemented, painfully, some of them have been, uh, to, in order to keep uh, Pennsylvanians safe. I mean, that has been, I don't want to sound like you know, uh, the governor or the secretary, they say it far better than I, I do, but it, these orders and recommendations really are about helping, keep, helping to keep Pennsylvanians safe. Uh, they're not taken upon lightly, uh, and, um, and, and they have been uh, implemented you know, tr trying to do a balancing test. Some of you may remember when we first uh, began to combat the rise of uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus, uh, you'll recall that Pennsylvania, unlike a number of states, actually began to shut down by region. Uh, it started in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and worked its way pretty much uh, to the west or actually to the northern, and, and ultimately uh, all of Pennsylvania was under what we were one time calling the red phase. Uh, the reopening has followed a similar trajectory in the opposite direction. However, uh, as we've noted, there have been, you know, at least there have been some setbacks here in southwestern Pennsylvania. So we're taking steps right now to try and arrest that. Uh, but um, I would just respectfully recommend to, to everyone that you, you be mindful of those, those orders and mandates uh, because mm -hmm. they're there really to protect everyone. Uh, yes, very true. Um, okay, so the final question I have for you right now is, um, how are people handling, or how should I handle or rehandle, non-compliant mask guests? The law says if they have a medical condition, they are not required to wear a mask, but we are not allowed to ask. What is to keep someone from just saying they have a medical condition and not compliant? 
Well, not to be terribly blunt, but as my uh, counsel on the arts client knows, and, and uh, I am also chief counsel to the Historical Museum Commission, which is also part of this call, uh, they know I'm fairly blunt spoken about certain things. And so I'll be blunt spoken here. Uh, first of all, we have to recognize that people lie. Sometimes they just do. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, we recommend that um, what the law really says you know, and what the um, order says that you're not allowed to demand a proof of the condition. And so, uh, for those who, who feel that they need to invoke a medical condition, uh, you know, it's a tough call. Uh, I, in many cases, you should be able to ascertain whether or not the person is being truthful. Uh, the reality is, um, you have a, if you have a masking policy in place, if you have clearly posted as uh, uh, Ms. Hollinshead have, has recommended, you know, having your protocols, uh, it's a tough situation to manage. You know, I, I won't say you have to turn them away. I won't say that you have to let them in, you, but you have to uh, assess the individual situation. If you encounter one individual who comes in and says this, that's one thing. If an entire family or a group of people come in, all of a sudden they're claiming that they have, uh, all of them have medical conditions, unless it's uh, a, a, an organization that you probably will be aware that everyone uh, uh, has such a condition, you probably got a bunch of liars there. And so again, you should uh, handle that like you would any other non-masking, non-mask wearing parties. Uh, some uh, uh, organizations are uh, engaging in some de-escalation training. Uh, that's certainly a, a, um, a uh, avenue that some of you may want to pursue. Uh, others, you know, are clearly posting the the um, the restrictions. Some of which with a little gusto. Some are saying no mask, no service, no mask, no admittance. Uh, some of you may want to try that approach. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, now, I will say one more thing. There, there seems to be also, uh, as you correctly noted, Sarah. There's some people who just don't want to wear a mask. Now, uh, I will just full disclosure, uh, I uh, have a, uh, an asthmatic condition. I hate it. I wear them. I wear my mask regularly. Don't like it. It's uncomfortable. I've heard a lot of people say that, but I do it. Uh, but there's some people who uh, have now been brandishing uh, something that uh, was brought to my attention called a face mask zip card. Let me just say that this. Uh, there's nothing legitimate about that document, but apparently has it's been produced to intimidate organizations from enforcing mask requirements. So you guys say this. Enforce your mask requirements, be mindful of legitimate um, me medical conditions, and it's something you're going to have to assess on a case by case basis. Great. Thank you so much, Rodney. And I'll circle back to you when we get to, our, to the, um, to get through a few other people because I have a, a really important question for you toward the end. Um, so now um, I'm going to, I'm going to turn to Linda and, um, Let's see, Linda. Uh, so my first question that came in from the pre-submitted questions is, I'm interested in how much an employer can reasonably be expected to provide as far as masks, cleaning supplies, et cetera, to keep employees safe. I'm all, um, so I, let's see. I'm also interested if library board can make policies that employees must quarantine if they have traveled out of state. So see, I want to an answer my question with a question. I would like Rodney's phone number on speed dial so I can call you <laughs> every time I have a question. <laughs> so I appreciate the, I, I, um, I'm really glad you got that mask question because we've had that to follow up on your comment. I've struggled for some clients. The person that comes in and says, I have a broken leg, I can't wear a mask. And I'll be like, really? Here are a couple of freebies. So we'll give you a couple <laughs> ones to try out. So um, on, the, on the issue of, you know, protective gear, who's responsible for the cost of it. I mean, honestly, it's incumbent upon the employer, the organization. So we are responsible of providing the masks to uh, the face coverings for our employees. Now, we are allowed to allow our employees to wear their own personal face coverings. That's permissible. And quite frankly, especially now that the mask covering law requires us to basically have it on when we step outside of our front door, people want to have their own, right? They, and, and you want them to have their own as they're walking into the building. So this, at the beginning when this happened, this was kind of a, it was a little tricky because when it came down on a Friday, I think it was a Friday or a Thursday, everyone was panicking, like, where am I going to get these masks? You can't order a thousand mm -hmm. of them on Amazon by Monday. Um, how are we going to get them available? But 
now we're kind of over that initial hump. Most people have them. What I'm telling organizations is it's a little bit of a, of a blended responsibility in the sense that most employees would like to have their own available, that's fine. But at the end of the day, an employer is responsible for ensuring that their employees have access to masks and that you need to have them available and on site to provide them. They are now much more widely available um, than they were before. I know there was a shortage mm -hmm. or of non um, N95 masks. I just got mine at one of the little computer stores, a box of 50 for 20 bucks. So you can get them. Employers can have them. Um, employers are getting them with emblems and stuff for face covering. So it is ultimately responsibility. If you read the April health order and you look at all the responsibilities, um, in addition to the fact that it's ultimately the responsibility of the employer to maintain cleaning protocols that you used to do and now to have the enhanced cleaning protocols. And then in addition, if you have a positive incident or a presumed, there's a additional protocols, there's specific guidance in the protocol that's, that specifically calls out, we as employers have to provide access for employees to regular hand washing with soap, hand sanitizer, disinfecting wipes, and ensuring that all common areas are clean. So at the end of the day, it's on us. So, you know, th this is an easy, this is sort of the low hanging fruit, I think, of the entire scheme. This is the easy stuff. Now that we can mm -hmm. finally get the sanitizer, I think, again, it's, it's available. We put up the extra hand sanitizing places, put up the extra places for people to get this. This is the stuff that makes people feel good. If I walk into a room and I see a little kiosk where I can get the stuff for my hands, mm -hmm. I'm going to feel a lot better about being in this organization. And I know that because I I have one of those like next door neighbor things in my neighborhood. And I have to tell you the neighbors that will tell me which place they went to yesterday to get their bread. And when somebody didn't like use the hand sanitizer before they walked in. So people see this stuff, mm -hmm. make it available to your employees. Don't short shrift on this stuff. This is the easy stuff for us. And it's also kind of right there in the order and that's not going to go away. So, and I see Rodney nodding. So he's going, he's going to help me. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, on, the issue, um, on the issue of, of um, travel, this is obviously um, um, a tough one. When I saw these, tra three months ago, we were laughing when we saw all the international travel advisories and everyone mm -hmm. said, oh, you can't go on an airplane. You're going to get quarantined. What's going to happen when you know, it becomes a, a domestic travel. And there was a, a state in New England that provided, um, I think it might have been New Hampshire, one of the New England states had that. And we all kind of scoffed and said, oh, that'll never happen. And here we are, right? So mm -hmm. now, here's the reality. I, um, I was laughing and I said, everybody's going to go dip their toe in the Outer Banks and come back and say they want two weeks off. And how are we going to deal with, um, you know, these quarantine issues? The, the reality is that as an employer, you can say to your employees, be forewarned that if you go and visit one of the states that is on this travel advisory, even though it is a recommendation or an advisory, um, New York's in more of an order as opposed to this one, which is structurally, I think, a little bit more like a recommendation and an advisory from a mm -hmm. legal standpoint. As an employer, you absolutely can say that they can quarantine, that you can require them to quarantine because they have been to one of those jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. I have had employers do it. I have had employers do it with not feeling great about it, but knowing that they feel like they need to. And what I would suggest mm -hmm. is if that's going to be what you do, communicate to your employees. Do not let that be a surprise that they wanna to go to their beach house in the Outer Banks they need mm -hmm. to know that there's a consequence for that. And I'm not saying that that's a problem, but here's the reality. If your people are already working from home right now, what's the big deal? They're already working mm -hmm. from home. Go to the Outer Banks, work from home at the Outer Banks for two weeks. I could care less. Come back and work from home at your house in Philadelphia. It doesn't matter where you are if you're not, this is only an issue if you're supposed to physically go back into a workplace. So the mm -hmm. draft advisories are there, but the answer is yes, you absolutely can do this. I just think that mm -hmm. there's a, a visceral reaction like that, that, that impedes my freedom of movement. What, your freedom yeah. of your beach house? Plan mm -hmm. for it, folks, all right? And, and let it, this is, we have got to get a little more adult responsibility about these issues and recognize mm -hmm. We would not have these orders if somebody didn't say we've got a little bit of, of, of paying attention to do about all of this movement and the impact that it's having. So 
That's right. where I think we need to come out on it. So a, a question just popped up, popped up in the chat, Linda, um, yeah. that pertains to that. I'm just going to follow up with that. Do you need to pay them while they're in quarantine if they are working in the library, not at home? So yeah. it, it, in the so do, do you need to pay them while they are in quarantine? Okay, so it, it depends. So a couple of buckets of pay potentially. If you have, you know, paid time off, vacation time, personal days, um, employer provided buckets of time, maybe depends on what your policy is. If you would like to make those buckets of days available and suck up that time for that purpose, you could certainly do that. That would be fine. You have, I think, a, an operational decision as to whether or not you want to make that available. Doing so may may or may not entice the use of that of that travel. So you have to make it that. Mm -hmm. Whether or not, um, I've looked at whether or not in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh where there's mandatory sick leave, um, the question would become whether or not if you're quarantined because of the voluntary uh, travel advisory, because Philadelphia has a travel advisory also, it's uh, also sort of recommended as opposed to an order. Mm -hmm. I think as written, you are not compelled to allow the mandatory sick leave under Pittsburgh or Philadelphia's ordinance. The, right. There's not a lot of guidance, but it would seem to be a, a reasonable position to take that those mandatory sick leave banks are not guaranteed to be available to those employees for that purpose. FFCRA, um, which is some of you are small enough that you would be covered by the Families um, First Coronavirus Response Act leave. Uh, that also seems to be derived from whether or not there is an order. I would take the position at the moment that the guidance, the recommendations, the advisories that have been issued now are not falling within FFCRA. So mm -hmm. things that are legally required, buckets of money, I would say probably not available. Um, if you mm -hmm. have a company provided or employer provided buckets of money, you could probably pay those if you wish to do so. Okay, great. Thank That's you. different, by the way, that if you're a health provider or a government body has ordered you to stay home because right. of some sort of exposure. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. What if an employee refuses to return to work from furlough because he or she is afraid? Yeah. Um, I, I am, so first of all, I'm very empathetic. I'm also a parent of two kids, one of whom has just had her freshman year in college ruined, you know, by COVID. So I believe me, I'm split when I, I have my work answer and I have my, you know, mom answer. Um, we're all afraid, right? We're all afraid about every single decision we make for our families. And you have a lot of employees. So this requires us, I think, to have a lot of compassion, I think, when we're, mm -hmm. we're dealing with these issues. Um, the way the laws have been drafted, just being nervous about returning and afraid to be returning when there isn't actually a legitimate safety or, or health infraction is not a basis to not come to work. And to follow up on something Rodney said, certainly if there is a legitimate violation of a health or safety code or recommendation, if there's an OSHA infraction, you don't come to work. You could that, right. that could be a legitimate basis to not come to work. I'm assuming that, that this is not that situation. I saw that question in the queue. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody who's just nervous, say, I, I don't feel comfortable, but I don't have any particular articulable reason why. Um, that's not a legitimate reason to decline to return to work. So what are your options? Well, you do look at all the, you know, when I sort of triage this, I would say to a client, before you say no, you do need to look at your various buckets of, of money, buckets mm -hmm. of responsibility. In some jurisdictions, the definitions of the sick leave laws are a little broader, so I would maybe have a different answer if I was in a different jurisdiction. But in Pennsylvania, where there's no mandatory sick leave, but maybe in the local jurisdictions, I still would say just being nervous is not going to be covered. Um, if you have a legitimate medical issue that is, get, you have a doctor's note that says, your doctor says, I can't come to work because I have a condition, a comorbidity that makes me concerned about coming back to work, and my doctor has said I shouldn't because, that mm -hmm. may be a reason for you to not come back to work under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think if the person's really nervous, you have to start putting your creative hat on like you would under any other ADA accommodation situation. Could that person remain a viable member of your workforce by continuing to right. work from home? Um, a lot of us have gotten much better at acknowledging that jobs can be done from home. And not obviously in many of your positions, that's not the case. Um, public facing positions, certainly right. not. But we have a lot of back office jobs that can. So you have to consider that as a possibility. 
Um, I would also suggest that, you know, before you have that knee jerk reaction of come on, don't be scared, which is not a very productive way of responding to it. You do want to have sort of your triage list of going through to make sure that that person doesn't have a compelling reason that would trigger protection under one of the leave mm -hmm. laws. Um, that doesn't have an, a, something that would entitle that person to accommodations? Is there something that is troubling that person that you could alleviate that concern? Uh, maybe they haven't seen visibly the changes that you've put in place, the guards, the, the space allocation, all the different things that you've done to make the workplace safe, um, mm -hmm. things that would alleviate that. Um, and at, at the end of the day, ultimately, just being nervous is not a reason. Um, possibly the person would also qualify for unemployment compensation if the mm -hmm. person depending on the circumstances as well. So yeah, there, there is a, a triage. Right, right. Just okay. Not, not um, should we have volunteers and patrons sign a liability waiver? And that's come up in the chat as well. I've seen yeah. it. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to give this, um, this is a, a discussion that could go on for an hour. So let me give you sort of the, the framework. And um, this is not going to be the same answer for every organization. There's two answers to this. One is legal and one is optics. Okay. I can guarantee every single one of you on this call has signed a waiver at some point in time. I probably signed mm -hmm. 50 for my son. Every time he goes jump on a trampoline at one of these like jumpy places, I sign a waiver saying that if he cracks his head open, I'm not going to sue, right? We sign waivers mm -hmm. all the time to say that we assume risk. This is what we're talking about right now. When we have people come into our locations, are we willing to assume risk? The way COVID-19 operates right now, we've essentially been told that we assume the risk the minute we walk outside of our houses, right? Uh, or the mm -hmm. minute we invite somebody into our home who is not a member of our immediate family that we have been sort of hunkered down with. So the, the answer under Pennsylvania law, it just conceptually is that an adult can actually waive liability um, them, for themselves. Um, and that, as long as it's a clear, conspicuous waiver and there's certain bells and whistles that need to be put into that document um, to demonstrate that the waiver of liability has been articulated and that it has to include waivers, including on account of that person's own negligence. So on the, the hierarchy of waivers, I would say that in general, you're not having your employees do it because that's a violation of public policy. Employees cannot be asked to violate their, or to waive their rights to workers' compensation, their rights to a safe workplace. Okay. There's no such thing as an advanced waiver of employee rights. Volunteers, assuming they're truly volunteers and not employees, um, third-party contractors, same thing, potentially guests that come into your spaces. You could ask them to sign waivers. Many of you probably have that on the back of tickets, for example, that you have yeah. signing waivers already. The question right. is, how, how do you accomplish that? So the waiver for an adult could be accomplished, but remember, waivers can only be for the person who executes that waiver on behalf of themselves. An adult cannot waive rights on behalf of their minor children. An adult could waive a claim on behalf of themselves vis-a-vis -vis that child that I can't mm -hmm. sue for a claim related to my loss of companionship for my child, but I can't waive my child's claim. I also can't buy tickets for my group of seven and waive claims on behalf of every adult that I bought the ticket for. So there's going to be some practical reality too of, you know, how, how many people are signing the waivers. Maybe I signed it for myself, but I have a gap now. I didn't sign it for all the other people in my group mm -hmm. and I didn't sign it for my children. So there's another way to accomplish on that continuum of waivers both for volunteers, for guests, for patrons who people come into your place. Maybe mm -hmm. you do it through um, what we basically say, websites and signage and sort of the acknowledgement. Um, and, and this is sort of a, a an assent to a liability waiver because you are a guest onto our property. And when you um, are a business invitee, there's a whole body of law that says if you come into our premises and we advise you of the risks of doing so and you knowingly and voluntarily assent to that, how did I do that? Because that big sign that said, if you come in here, it says the following, and you'll start to notice those signs are now up everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a way to assent to risk. And so many of you need to start to begin to think about how am I communicating the risks associated with bringing people into our place of business? 
it's a little bit offensive, right? To say, you walk in here, we welcome you with open arms, public, but by the way, you could get ill or die by coming in here. I mean, that is the language that essentially needs to be proclaimed when mm -hmm. you're talking about assenting to risk. So there's continuum. What I would say is that it is a decision and a discussion that every organization needs to have because assents to liability work as long as they're knowing and voluntary and you need to have very conspicuous signage that is out there that you could say, yeah, it was really obvious when I came into my theater or I came into this building that I understood that by coming in, I might expose myself to other members of the public or other people. And even mm. though um, we've done a great job cleaning and everything else, um, we've done certain things um, in a certain way. I saw, saw a question of how, what's Disney doing? I would love to know exactly what Disney is doing. <laughs> um, I have seen some things. Disney uh, is a bit of a moving target. I've seen what Disney China and, and there's a lot of diff different Disney things. Disney is doing a combination thereof. Third piece of this, and then I'm going to defer to somebody else. The third piece of this to minimize your risk is requiring um, health uh, certifications. And that is what we're all doing, which is me coming into your place of operation saying, I'm healthy. I don't have a fever. I don't have the symptoms of COVID. I haven't been next to anybody who's had a symptom of COVID. And I'm certifying to you that I'm healthy. Why is that important? That's almost as important, if not more important than the waivers themselves. Because if I, as an organization, am ensuring that everybody who comes into my place says that, I'm doing a pretty good job mm -hmm. of minimizing risk. Because I am now at, like, and that, that back to Rodney's point, I can't prevent people from lying. But if I take that step to ensure that everybody who comes in here is saying, I am healthy, then I am doing a very good job of minimizing the risk that I am putting myself into a situation where I'm going to have an exposure. So th those are the, the actual waivers of liability, the assents to liability through some sort of uh, signage and disclaimers on websites and posters and the health certification components, all three of which need to be something your organization is thinking about, both for volunteers, third-party contractor, visitors, guests, and then your patrons coming in. And, and I've been doing that with a lot of organizations and organizations come out very different positions depending on their comfort level with these issues. Right, right. Wow, that's a lot of really great information. Thank you so much, Linda. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see, it looks like I'm just doing a time check. We're uh, almost at 20 after 11 and um, just really quickly, I know that um, you know everybody's very busy. So we're gonna try to get through some more questions and whatever, like I said in the beginning, whatever doesn't get answered um, in this session today, I will be following up with everybody um, and hopefully, and just really quick, Lori or Taylor, one of you, can you just tell me, because, uh, you know, the Zoom technology is not my thing. Thank you so much, Taylor, for being the Zoom expert. I really appreciate it. Does the chat get archived as well since we're recording the, the, the webinar? Hi, yes, this is Taylor. We will be saving the chat, so we'll have all the questions that were sent. Wonderful. To. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and turn and, and ask um, our friends from PHMC, um, uh, Corey, Rachel, and Brenda. Um, a couple of questions and I'll let you guys decide who you want to answer um, the questions. But uh, so the first one is, can you cover rules or, or, and approaches for historic sites and places that have limitations because of preservation needs of collections and architecture? Hi, I'm Rachel. I'll um, touch on this a little bit. I am with the Bureau of Historic Sites and Museums and I have been tasked with gathering information from various museum associations on how to go about cleaning historic surfaces. And for us, I've been telling most of our sites, I will say, first off, I am not a conservator. Um, if you have specific questions about specific surfaces, you might want to consult with a conservator about them. Um, this is a general overview of the surfaces touched on um, various museum associations. Um, I've been consulting with um, the National um, Center for their name, their acronym is so confusing. Center for Preservation Technology and Training. They're a big site that I've been using as well as the um, Canadian Conservation Institute um, and ASLH. They have um, some really informative uh, suggestions as to how to go about cleaning 
historic surfaces. Um, as far as historic artifacts go, um, disinfecting is not suggested at all. Um, the main suggestion is isolating an artifact if you think it is contaminated with COVID-19. Um, you can do that by putting it in a plastic bag, marking the date, and setting it aside based off of the material that it is made out of. And I can also provide additional resources um, like the NCPTT um, quick guide, which is really helpful. It touches on how long to isolate various surfaces from wood to metal to plastic. Um, so it kind of covers all bases. Um, and then it also provides information on how to clean surfaces. Um, it's really hard because we can't disinfect historic surfaces like we do our um, countertops or places like our desks and computers. So we have to be a little bit more uh, careful and use gentler solutions. Um, so for that, we're really suggesting using um, Orvis, which is a pH neutral soap um, diluted in distilled water um, for most surfaces, um, ranging from uh, painted wood to uh, doorknobs to light switches, um, as well as exhibit cases, excuse me. <clears throat> um, so I can send out a lot of information on that. that would be um, great. It might be a little helpful for time too. Okay, that would be great. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Um, and the second question that I have for you folks is, um, it's actually more of a statement, but maybe you could speak to it. Um, safety for volunteers that no longer want to volunteer due to COVID-19 or lack of safe safety supplies when we open. Do you have any uh, comments for that? Brenda, Rachel, or Corey? I'm sorry, I had to unmute. This That's is Brenda. Okay. <laughs> I forgot. Um, so I would say, you know, we, a number of the speakers today have been talking about safety and how important safety issues are. And um, I think for my sites and the Bureau of Historic Sites and Museums, we are really allowing volunteers to determine whether they are comfortable coming back to our facilities or not. And really, um, it's up to them, their own comfort level. Um, to have them come back. We do have some volunteers who are teleworking. Um, you know, there are things like transcribing documents or, you know, cataloging an artifact. Um, if, you know, there's a photograph of something or helping with a public program that can be done virtually. So we are still engaging with our volunteers, but in terms of having them come back, it's really up to them. And then in terms of safety supplies, uh, my recommendation is shop around. Um, you know, as someone yeah, mentioned, yeah. it was Linda who mentioned earlier, um, things are getting a little easier to find. But I would also say that as you shop around, the Better Business Bureau is your friend. And if you are, if you're looking at a company that you have never heard of, that uh, doesn't have a lot of ratings, uh, do a little bit of research before you buy those hand sanitizing stations from that particular vendor. Oh, that's a great point. Great point. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to skip to Lori now. Is Lori online? There you are. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to actually just pose a, the second question on my list to you, Lori. Um, how can we connect with our older populations who don't have internet and do not feel safe coming out? Uh, with our older populations? Yes. Yes. Um, so, um, you know, from our uh, um, uh, program uh, staff and what we have been seeing uh, with our grantees, um, uh, uh, as well as our partners, um, Different, organi different organizations and partners have been doing many, many different things, very creative things, um, uh, in order to um, keep uh, folks engaged. Um, from, uh, I know locally here, um, Upper Chichester, who is working with us, has actually come um, uh, put together a kit um, that can be um, uh, um, used um, by uh, folks who want to participate. Um, I think that um, there are, uh, you know, a number of very creative ways um, to um, keep 
um, all kinds of uh, different participants um, engaged. Um, and it's not only for um, uh, uh, pr potential participants um, who are older, but um, those that uh, are, uh, may not have um, internet um, or access um, in our communities. Um, mm. So right. I hope that that's, how, that, that that's helpful. I, what we're seeing is a, a lot of um, uh, creative responses um, right. to this. No, that, that's a great point. And I think that's one of those things too, that just really looking around and seeing what other organizations are doing and, and like working with what you can do within your own organization based on what your capacity is. So very good point, very good point. So <clears throat> I'm going to go to Nora Johnson next. Um, and we looks like we have four minutes left. Um, so, Nora, this this question actually came up in in a couple of different um, iterations. But so I'm I'm sure you can answer it because you're this is your area of expertise or one of the many areas of expertise you have. Um, how often should we communicate our safety protocols to patrons? Any examples of best practices for these communications? Um, so I think that frequency is a little bit tricky to answer in terms of like a part and parcel recommendation because it's really specific to your organization and your activities. Um, so I think the primary considerations in terms of messaging right now is to think about how to make your audience or potential audience feel really comfortable coming back when you are ready to welcome them back. Um, obviously a lot of uh, live performing arts organizations are not at that point yet, um, but for museums, for example, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, messaging on their websites and videos around what you can expect when you come back. Um, and you also want to be messaging specific to the platform that you're using. So um, you want to have something that's specific to your web users. You want to have something that if people are accessing your information on Instagram, you have maybe a um, video that's just shot on somebody's phone of somebody walking around in the space and talking about the lengths and steps that you've taken to ensure um, health and safety in your environment. Um, so you also wanna be thinking about um, incorporation of the practices that people would be beginning to be very mindful of and better about in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility in spaces. So really speaking to a broad variety of individuals and helping them understand how they are welcome to the space. And that is important more than ever right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, thinking about the question that somebody just brought up, uh, part of it too is education of a variety of your staff and volunteers so that um, mm -hmm. if you have an older potential visitor who calls you on the phone to talk about um, whether you're open and what they can expect if they go, making sure that everybody who is there is able to talk about um, the health and safety protocols that they have, that you have in place and mm -hmm. um, why they should feel comfortable. Um, one of the things to consider is that um, uh, I think Linda had said, you know, people see, and you have to remember that um, <laughs> it might be difficult to, uh, ask someone to put on a mask, you know, but people see you do that and it helps them be comfortable. You don't see the people that don't come because you haven't explained why it's safe for them to do so. You only, mm -hmm. you, you hear, you only hear one side of it. You don't see the people who don't come. So you want to make sure that you do as thorough a job as possible of illustrating all across your platforms and then in your physical space and outside of your physical space in signage, et cetera, um, why people should be confident in your health and safety protocols. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I could talk more, but that's no, great points. Great points. So I'm going to defer to the panel because we are at 1129 and I still have a number of questions that we have not gotten to today. Um, and since this is my first time kind of, uh, being the moderator, I guess, of a panel on, in a, in a, uh, virtual setting, do we want to continue or do, I mean, I know, like I said, everybody has very busy lives. Do we want to at least get through the um, uh, submitted, uh, pre-submitted questions? Yes. Can you give me a thumbs up? Okay. Okay. All right. So 
let's see. Thank you very much, Nora. Um, so next I'm going to go to Dana Payne. So Dana, you're still muted. Okay. So Dana, my first question for you is what are some creative ways different organizations are connecting or, or planning on connecting with their community virtually? So uh, one of the things um, that I found out uh, over a month ago, uh, I had a uh, group call with uh, grantees uh, from one of my uh, programs in uh, the Preserving Diverse Cultures Division. Uh, and this is a, a grant program uh, that has uh, over a little over 40 um, art organizations, uh, Alana art organizations throughout the state. And, you know, at that point in time, I was very concerned about how people were doing. Um, you know, I know that early on, um, performances were canceled. You know, people were traveling and touring, some here, some overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, and auto automatically, all of a sudden, everything shut down. Uh, and I, you know, was so concerned about uh, the financial impact. And to my surprise, one of the things that I found is that, you know, everybody transitioned quickly to mm -hmm. online presentations. Uh, and that was a great thing. And then, you know, another thing was that they not only uh, transitioned to online um, presentations, but they collaborated with other organizations to do so. And they collaborated with maybe larger organizations to uh, present mm -hmm. dance performances, classes, um, you know, and I just thought it was great how so many organizations adapted to a virtual uh, platform. Um, but one of the things that um, still remains um, in the, the category of needs is that in doing so, um, the, they use the most basic uh, virtual platforms. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking uh, Facebook and, you know, mm -hmm. other social media platforms. And the issue with that becomes who owns that content? So, you know, we're talking about artists uh, and, you know, artists own their work. They create the work that they're presenting, uh, organizations who support that. Uh, and, you know, so that was an issue. And then um, another issue is uh, monetizing uh, these online um, virtual presentations uh, because immediately everyone, you know, did it mostly uh, for free. Mm -hmm. Some are transitioning to uh, monetizing, but I, I didn't see overall how, um, you know, everyone was successful at it. So it was just another, um, this is another resource uh, that mm -hmm. worked to help people create. And then um, the last thing is that through these uh, collaborations, you know, I see um, uh, the, the organizations and the uh, individuals who have joined us. Uh, today, and I think mm -hmm. about the fact that, you know, we can have a small organization from Erie uh, collaborating with an organization in Philadelphia and another one in Pittsburgh to present a wonderful program. And do we know whether or not um, these organizations have the capacity to pull it off? Most of them do, some of them don't, uh, but I really uh, admire um, the way that everybody has just worked just like that mm -hmm. to, uh, transition. Right. So that's that's one of the things, and those are just some other things to keep in mind too. Right, right, great. Thank you. Sure. So now um, I'm gonna I'm just gonna what I what I think I'm gonna do is go ahead and just pose one more question to Carl um, because I don't want I want to be very mindful of people's time, and um, I know you know a lot of people probably have other meetings that they have to get to and all that good stuff, virtual meetings. So. Carl, if you could unmute yourself. Um, and, and just for people, for, for people that are still on this call, um, just a reminder again, we're going to follow up with all your questions and all. And, um, and so, you know, I'm sorry we didn't get to everything. I think Linda's right. We could have had probably a three hour conversation about this today. So Carl, um, my question to you is, how would you suggest performing arts companies subsidize their revenue 
with severely reduced theater capacities? Right, and, and, and that's a great question. And uh, I have a lot of uh, empathy here. Um, and, and we have questions across the board about this because frankly, especially for performing arts, things are, are not the same as they were in 2019. And it is a difficult road going forward. Uh, and just as organizations are in a situation that is completely different than they're used to, I think funding needs to respond to that. So when I look at funding, uh, I think that grant makers, uh, particularly at the federal, state, local level, need to change the way that they are providing grants and provide more flexibility. A lot of grants are related to specific projects at a specific time with specific audiences. Um, that's not happening a lot right now. So I think flexibility there in funding is key, recognizing mm -hmm. where we are. Uh, in terms of funding, uh, I'll also say in particular, um, this is a huge issue and the needs are great and the, reven the revenue loss is very large. Um, and it's important when the federal government uh, does things like uh, provide funding for the arts and the CARES Act. Um, and that was helpful. Uh, but I think there's a very big issue in the need outside, uh, outstrips the supply, frankly. Mm -hmm. In terms of other funding things, um, just as grant makers uh, might have to think differently about how they make grants, uh, perhaps sponsors uh, can be flexible as mm -hmm. well. How are they getting value as a sponsor in ways that are different than uh, were in the past? Uh, so continuing to stay engaged there. Uh, I have seen people create really intimate experiences with their audiences, um, sometimes at a small level. And that has also been a vehicle for cultivating new audience uh, and potentially cu cultivating uh, donors. Um, but ultimately this all uh, for this next period is gonna have to be bigger and different than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, that was, that was really informative. So we are at 11.37 um, and uh, I think we'll go ahead and just, I wanna thank every one of you for making this such a meaningful and wonderful conversation. Um, it's been, uh, I've just, my, I've been taking notes the whole time. So I've, I've learned a lot. I hope that all of our attendees have learned a lot and for the wonderful panelists and speakers, I really can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules um, to make to make this possible. Um, and I, you know, I don't, Carl, if you have any parting um, words, uh, thanks. I, my parting word is I've just learned how to use unmute. Um, <laughs> again, I want to thank everybody and also say. Um, we're thinking about you a lot in the creative sector. Mm -hmm. Stay healthy, stay safe. Yes, definitely. And stay tuned because we might have more conversations just like this one. Um, obviously, this is something that people are really longing for. So once again, everyone, uh, just like Carl said, stay happy, healthy, and safe. And thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of your week.